It's TechPub, and in this screencast, we are going to tackle Linux for softies. Are you a Microsoft developer? Are you curious about Linux? Heard about it? Read about it? Don't know anything about it? Maybe you've heard about Rails and are a little bit worried about, well, what am I going to have to do if I have to learn Rails? Well, this screencast is for you. In this screencast, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually install Linux from the ground up. I'm going to configure it with Apache Web Server, MySQL, also with PHP and what they call the LAMP stack. Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, Perl, you can lump that in there as well. And then I'm going to create a Rails site and show you how you can hook up Apache Web Server to Rails. So let's install Linux. It's easy, it's fun. If you're going to play along at home, you might want to just put this into a virtual machine. You can use a virtual PC. There's some caveats i got to throw at you. If you're going to do that, you might have some rendering issues to deal with. But by and large, it's the easiest thing to do if we're going to be installing a server. If you have UI stuff you're going to deal with, well, you might want to use something like VMware. Um, if you're going to be doing this on a server, Hyper-V is something you really want to take a look at if you have Windows Server 2008. Hyper-V is built in. It's their built-in virtualization system. I use that on my blog. Or if you're an Amazon customer and you like using Amazon Cloud Computing, Amazon EC2 will support the uh, instantiation and kick up, for lack of better words, of Ubuntu. And you can uh, go in and you can set up your cloud. You can dedicate a certain amount of RAM and processor speed and you pay for this instance uh, by the hour of use. And again, I don't have a lot of crazy configuration or settings to do. I just got to format my partitions. I'm just going to go with all the defaults. And when it says, do you want me to write this? You say yes. So now that we're installing the base system, uh, it's going to take a minute or two. Actually, it's going to take about 10 minutes. So while this is happening, we can have a little discussion about uh, Linux and the history of Linux. Where did it come from? Who are the people behind it? So this is the history of Linux in three minutes or less. Back in the 70s, there was pretty much one operating system called Unix. It's what everybody used. Uh, it was a closed system run by AT&T's Bell Labs. And one day, one of the bearded coders out there named Richard Stallman, who worked uh, at MIT's Artificial Intelligence Labs, um, decided, hey, wait, this is lame that this is closed. I got some problems with some software I'm trying to create. I need to fix it. And the bug is emanating from Unix. I can't fix it. It's closed. And so AT&T wouldn't budge. He said, you know what? I'm going to just do this on my own. So in the 80s, he started the new project, or GNU as he pronounces it, and it's G-N-U, and the acronym means GNU's Not Unix, which is, of course, a little bit of recursive hackerish fun. So he started that project, and along the same time, he wrote the very first uh, open source, what they call copyleft license, L-G-P-L, the GNU Public License pretty much guaranteed that if you wrote software using that license, it would stay free and open forever. Well, that went along pretty well. Uh, cruising through the 80s uh, into the 90s, he was pretty close to rewriting the entire Unix operating system. He had most of the stuff done. He had a few problems here and there. And one thing he didn't have was a kernel. The kernel runs the operating system. The kernel handles all the disk I.O. and a bunch of devices. But it wasn't quite working for him. Uh, they couldn't quite get it right. Then along comes a guy from the University of Helsinki, a graduate student who is going to do a project in computer science. And he decides, hey, this GNU thing looks pretty good. I like the idea of an open operating system. OK, our gem live's been updated. We have the latest. And now comes the fun. Let's install Rails. Uh, pseudo gem install rails, probably a line that you've read before. In this case, I want to add in a couple switches here. Uh, I don't want any documentation because it's the server. It's not going to be needed. Nor do I want Ruby's built-in re-documentation for rails. Uh, so that's, again, because I'm not going to be developing on the server. This is just going to be receiving things. Uh, so it doesn't make much sense to have documentation here. Now you want to have documentation on your local machine. So this is going to reach out to um, the gem library and install the Rails gem on my machine. 
It's just going to install a bunch of gems. Rails is uh, Rails is a gem as well as it's kind of like Congress in the United States. You call Congress both uh, the House of Representatives as well as the entire thing, the Senate and the House of Representatives. Same thing with Rails. Rails is a gem and it's also a collection of gems. Uh, so once that's installed, we'll be good to go. All right, Rails is installed, good to go. We have the Rails gem itself that you can see at the bottom there. We also have Rake, Active Support, Active Record, Rack, Action Pack, all the things that go into making Rails run. So if we wanted to, we could actually create a Rails site and pop it behind the built-in web server, WebRick or Mongrel, and we could be done using port 80. But uh, we're gonna continue on here and install Passenger. So you can think of Apache as a little bit of gravity at the core of a swirling mass of modules and configuration files. It might sound scary at first, but it's really not. If we take a look at the directory structure, it's sort of organized by convention. And inside ETC Apache 2, uh, you can see inside here we have the configuration for Apache 2 itself, apache2.conf. We also have these folders called modules enabled and modules available, sites enabled, sites available. These are the convention-based folders. If Apache finds configurations inside of them, it tells Apache, hey, use these things, make these sites available, uh, or make these sites enabled, excuse me, uh, and here's your basic configuration for each one. Okay, well, the next thing I need to do is I need to create a page in my new site directory. I'm going to create one called index.htm. I'm going to open up VI, and in here I'm just going to plant in some headers, some H1s, and uh, it'll just output hello world why not that's what everybody does okay i'm going to close this thing off and then hit escape to get out of here colon and write and quit and so that saves it back down now that we have our configuration and our web page set up uh, it's time to disable the default site uh, this turns it off essentially and we're going to issue the command a2 dis site which is apache 2 disable site and pass in the name of the configuration which in this case is default to enable a site, you type in A2 and site, which is enable. And then the name of your new configuration, my new site. Now what we can do is go back to our browser, refresh this page, and wahoo, hello world. It's a good sign. So now we're pointed off to the right site. Now what we can do is we can build a Rails application.